Right. We are going to have a session on ERCP today. My name is Jang Dilavri. I started doing ERCP when I was in London with uh, Peter Cotton. And I came to the Chandigarh Postgraduate Institute. And apparently, everybody tells me I was the first one to do ERCP and first one to remove the bile duct stones. And I have trained a lot of gastroenterologists in India uh, in endoscopy and also in the technique of ERCP in Chandigarh. And I have the great uh, honor and pleasure uh, to ch have a chat with uh, Gregory Haber. Why don't you tell about yourself, Gregory Haber? What are you doing <laughs> okay. these days? Well, um, it's interesting. Our, our careers actually started around the same time. When you were with Peter Cotton, I was in Toronto finishing up my general GI fellowship with Norm Marcon. Now, Marcon was uh, a, a tremendous um, uh, endoscopist and had great passion. And uh, he had trained at St. Mark's and had learned to do colonoscopy. So colonoscopy was the first clinically applicable endoscopy. And when I was a fellow under him, he wanted me to learn ERCP. So he encouraged me to go to England, uh, and I went with a chap by the name of Paul Salmon. I don't know if you remember Paul Salmon. Oh yeah, Salmon. I know Paul Salmon. Okay. So Peter was president of the um, British Society of uh, Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, and Paul Salmon, whom I trained with, followed him in that role. Anyway, I, I digress. So yeah. what happened was, I, after I finished my regular training, I did endoscopy in England, and I came back to Canada in uh, the late 70s, 78, 79, and started doing ARCP at that time. And then I was stayed at the University of Toronto until um, 14 years ago when I moved to New York to be chief of gastroenterology at Lenox Hill Hospital. And in the last three years, uh, chief of endoscopy at uh, NYU, New York University Medical Center. Yeah, let's talk about ERCP now, okay? Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you're here for. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Why not? See, okay. the ERCP, there's, there's a long history of ERCP. And people used to do diagnostic ERCP, and then diagnostic ERCP went down, and yes. therapeutic ERCP came. Now, how do you see, let's get to the really Trucks of the matter is how do you see ERCP in future? Is there any role of future ERCP? Well, for sure there is. Yeah. Um, but I think we have witnessed the transition from ERCP, which started out as purely diagnostic, mm. and now it's almost purely therapeutic. So um, ERCP now is is uh, is strictly for management of pathology identified on cross-sectional imaging, MRIs, MRCP, it just dramatically altered uh, kind of the, uh, the basis for ERCP. It altered the, the therapeutic indication the, as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's what I mean. It, yeah. it, it ended diagnostic yeah. Yeah. ERCP. And now, uh, even in patients who cannot tolerate MRI, endoscopic ultrasound has replaced MRI in those patients who you know, cannot tolerate going into the machine. Um, so I think, you know, but it's interesting because all of therapeutic ERCP is really based on good cannulation skills, which is what we learned in the diagnostic era. Mm -hmm. So cannulating is still the crux of the matter for ERCP. You have to be able, to, once you have a wire in the bile duct, you can almost do anything uh, you yeah, like. Absolutely. Or the pancreatic mm -hmm. duct. But the problems now with the complications of ERCP, and that's why the patients are a bit reluctant to have an ERCP because they read about in the literature or in the press that the complications of ERCP. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you see, how can we reduce the complications of ERCP, like post-ERCP pancreatitis right. is one sure. huge complication. Right. Well, I, I think, to me, there are sort of two things that have happened. First, um, there's been a, a much greater awareness of pancreatitis as a severe and sometimes fatal complication that can occur randomly. 
mm. and when you barely touch the papilla. So that of course is one in a million, but just the fact that that can happen and the awareness that we have of the potent adverse effects, I think makes us much better at it and it occurs much less without any other intervention, just the awareness alone. Because now we are only attempting or going beyond the normal attempts when we realize it's absolutely necessary to cannulate, get into the duct, whatever. Now we recognize the need to back off and, and not be overly aggressive uh, in the face of possible pancreatitis, and we know the risk factors. You know, the young females, obese, previous pancreatitis, um, sphincter of OD dysfunction, whatever that is. So we know what the risk factors are and we respect them. It's, it's now that we respect them. So that's one side. The flip side is that everybody who has an ERCP today, if there's any risk whatsoever, they all get indicent suppositories. It's just automatic for every ERCP. They all get uh, a liter of ringers lactate, uh, lactated ringers, and uh, so... And, and stent in the pancreatic duct? No. Huh? So the only time they get a stent in the pancreatic duct is when there's inadvertent placement of the wire okay, into the right. pancreatic yeah, duct two or yeah. three times, yeah. then we'll leave a prophylactic stent. I just had to give a talk, actually today, and one of the papers I reviewed mm. was uh, a publication that came out two months ago, and they actually looked at uh, pharmacologic prophylaxis alone or pharmacologic prophylaxis with a pancreatic stent. Mm. And they did it prospectively, mm. randomized controlled trial, uh, patients at higher risk for pancreatitis. Those are where you have cannulated the pancreatic duct? No, these were just, they, they agreed, they were coming for an ERCP, and, and they agreed to the randomization and the treatment, regardless of whether you got it in the pancreatic duct. Oh, okay, right, yeah. Mm. But they were for biliary cannulation. But the bottom line was, mm. there was no advantage to place a pancreatic stent over and above the pharmacologic prophylaxis. Yeah, what, what happens if you entered the pancreatic duct? So if you've entered the pancreatic duct, that, um, I don't think that in the trial, that even if you entered, you didn't get a pancreatic stent. Mm -hmm. But in practice, mm -hmm. in practice, if I go into the pan pancreatic duct two or three times with a wire, even if I don't inject contrast, um, I have a very low threshold for placing a very small, soft plastic stent. Yeah. stent. Yeah. Soft polyethylene. Not for how long? For a week? Small enough that they, 80% will fall out within a week. Okay. So okay. they're just prophylactic stents, mm -hmm. five French, short. Um, sphincter of OD, is that you still do any cannulation of sphincter of OD patients? No more. Finally, I think uh, Indiana, and uh, University of uh, uh, South Carolina have given up the ghost on mm. manometry and Marty Freeman too up in Minneapolis. So we're three centers in the United States mm. where all the tertiary referrals went to mm. for sphincter of OD dysfunction. And it was either uh, South Carolina, Indiana, or Minneapolis. Mm. And then I did manometry, I did about 200 cases in the days when sphincter of OD dysfunction was thought to be a disease. Mm. And I still think it is an entity, I don't know if we call it a disease, but the one thing that makes it real is the very high risk of pancreatitis in that population when they have ERCP. Mm. Yeah. So That's there is something right. different about them. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, they're not just crazy people. Mm. There's mm. something mm. about their sphincter mm. mechanism. Mm. But having said that, I found that when I did manometry, I could make somebody, I could give somebody a hypertensive sphincter if I wanted to, mm. by tilting the catheter up or down with the elevator. Absolutely. Yeah. So it was a very subjective thing. Mm. Mm. So if you were doing a study and you had to enroll hypertensive sphincter patients, mm. all you had to do was just lift the elevator a little bit and the pressure yeah. jumped up Absolutely. and they were into the study. Yeah. 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 So. The bottom line was I, I never felt that manometry 
was that accurate or that objective. Yes, yes. So I didn't do manometry, so, but I would still offer sphincterotomy to type two or type one. If they had distinct jump in their enzymes uh, with episodes of pain, reversion to normal after the pain, uh, I consider that enough now, evidence. The EUS and, and MRCP, they have come in, in a way, some competition, particularly EUS. You can do therapeutic procedure through the EUS. How do you see future of, of ERCP? having EUS competing with ERCP now. Right. Well, there are studies that have looked at um, directly accessing the bile duct with EUS through the duodenum and avoiding the papilla mm -hmm. to avoid the pancreatitis. And two studies out of Korea showed that EUS was less risky in a mm -hmm. prospective randomized controlled trial. Mm -hmm. But the argument is that their ERCP population in those groups, in, in, in those studies, uh, the pancreatitis rates were way too high. And so one assumes from that that they weren't very experienced with the ERCP. But in Orlando, uh, Shyam Verader Julu, who's one of our uh, bright uh, endoscopists, did a, a randomized control trial, so showed that there was no difference with. EUS, in fact, EUS was worse in terms of complications. The bottom line is, um, I think we need EUS as a backup so that we don't have to uh, persist with ERCP beyond a reasonable amount of time, effort, and abuse of the papilla. Oh yes, that's right. That's very so at important. a certain point you have to stop, that's important. Yeah. and then if it's very important, then you can fall back to have EUS. Complimentary. Yeah, 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 it should be yeah. complimentary. Yeah. It will not replace it. Yeah. Because Everybody wants to preserve the function of the, you know, uh, of the anatomy. We don't want to make a hole between mm -hmm. the duodenum mm -hmm. and the bile duct. Mm -hmm. And that has a risk of bile leak and other problems. That's right. So, How do you, is, are the instrumentation, uh, obviously there have been a lot of development in instrumentation. How do you see the future development of instrumentation, in, particularly in the spread of infection? Because a lot of infections come with the elevator thing. That's right. And uh, and people have now found resistant bugs, uh, uh, particularly in ERCP. Right. And there have been some problems. How do you see? Well, I, I think um, the infections which have occurred, which have made us aware of the issues with mm. cleaning duodenoscopes. And I even recall sometimes receiving a duodenoscope that was supposedly cleaned. And when I moved the elevator, I could see dried brown oh, material yeah, yeah, under yeah. the elevator that was never cleaned, yeah. really. So I think that the technicians who were cleaning the scopes just relied on the machine. They didn't brush behind the elevator, et cetera, et cetera. So infection was a problem, mm -hmm. you know, but we have to put it into perspective. I mean, it was one in a million. Yeah. It wasn't like 1 in 10, 1 in 20, 1 in 100. So, um, but it does, of course, it, it made us much more aware of the transmissibility of, of uh, bacteria and, and viruses from the scope. And we, and but is there any work going on the, on the technology of the elevator? Changed completely now. Yeah. Every yeah. company now has yeah. uh, a, a removable cap, a replaceable cap, mm. um, methods to allow for cleaning behind the elevator mm. to ensure 100% cleaning. And there are companies that are developing disposable channel liners. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's right. the lining in the channel that carry the bacteria. Mm. And uh, so that's changing. But, and of course, the disposable duodenoscope, which I have to say personally, based on the waste that is involved, I philosophically very, am very not in favor of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. expensive, yeah. it's a huge yeah. burden on the environment. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's an a overreaction, yeah. an overreaction to the issue of contamination. I think it has to be addressed, it's, it's critical, but I think there are other ways to handle it. Do you it. see robotic surgery coming, robotic uh, ERCP coming, remote control, and like right. the laparoscopy and you know you it, it it um it would be nice yeah. but i don't 
see it happening in the near future. I've recently been involved in robotic colonoscopy for polyp removal in the rectum and sigmoid. And um, I have to say that is still about five years back in terms of developing the instruments for that. I think eventually, uh, you know, with 3D manufacturing of whatever you can imagine in your mind, people may be able to come up with uh, robotic devices for ERCP, but it's been tried. Mm -hmm. uh, there used to be a steerable catheter mm -hmm. with a joystick. I don't know, do you remember that at all? Boston Scientific yeah, had yeah, a uh, yeah. catheter with four wires in the four quadrants of the catheter yeah, tip. Yeah. And you could take a joystick and move the oh, tip, yes, 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 yes. move the tip of the, uh, of the yeah, cannula yeah, yeah, wherever yeah. you wanted it yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. But again, it just... It How many ERCP a student have to do, or a trainee has to do, in order to be certified that he can do ERCP independently, in your experience? Right. Well, I think the number that's been bandied about in various yeah. guidelines is around 200. 200, yeah. yeah. And of those, half should be therapeutic. Okay. Stentored or sphincterotomy. But, uh, you know, once again, I think if we're talking about ERCP, uh, I think it has to be, you have to treat the papilla like a piece of fragile china. Absolutely. That absolutely. can break very yeah, easily. Yeah, absolutely. And respect it. Respect. You have to respect it. Yeah. 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 And you have to be, uh, move it carefully, yeah. try not to distort the natural anatomy, yeah. Yeah. understand the particular uh, morphology of the papilla, the direction of the bile duct, mm -hmm. the axis that you're dealing with. Most of the cannulation has to be decided in your mind before you touch the, the, the yeah. cannula yeah. sphincter tone. Yeah. yeah, I agree. So, well, thank you very much indeed. It has been wonderful talking Fun. to you. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure.